I'm Paul Davies. I'm director of the Beyond Center for Fundamental Concepts in Science at Arizona State University. So are you a big wheel? Uh, little wheel, I think, <laughs> okay. uh, in the context of Arizona State. All right. Have you ever seen a UFO? Uh, no, no. Well, let me correct that. I've seen many weird objects in the sky that I could not immediately identify. But if you're asking, have I ever seen something which looks to me like evidence for alien visitation on Earth, the answer is no. Have you ever been abducted by aliens? Ah, yes, in my dreams. So this is an interesting uh, whole concept, because I think the alien abduction stories are uh, in effect, lucid dreams that people don't understand uh, that they are dreaming. So lucid dreaming is a uh, well-known phenomenon. It's much studied. Uh, I have studied it, and in fact, I have tried to induce lucid dreams. You can buy a face mask that flashes <laughs> lights in your eyes. Uh, <laughs> I bought this many years ago through New Scientists for £30. Uh, I thought, well, this looks pretty good. I'll give it a try. Uh, and it takes a bit of practice, but the, uh, the plan is that you're having normal, rather silly dreams, which people have all the time, sort of shapeless, formless, not very credible. Obviously, they are dreams. But so you haven't read uh, Freud well, much then? Uh, I've read a bit, bit of Freud, but, <laughs> but, but, but the point is, why, and Jung as well, but once you realize you're dreaming, you can gain control over the dreams and turn it into a lucid dream. And then it becomes uh, just like we are now, full technicolor, and all of the senses, including uh, the tactile senses, because mostly in dreams uh, it has this sort of wishy-washy quality and you don't really feel pain or touch or anything like that. You're sort of floating around. But in a lucid dream, you get all that. And so uh, dreams that combine lucidity with levitation, a feeling that you're floating or flying, and the tactile sense of being touched or probed all add up, in my mind, to alien abduction. So, so wait a minute, this mask you bought, you put on the mask and then it had lights on the inside and it would shine lights in your eyes so as your eyes are closed? Right, it, it picks up the rapid eye movement, which and is a sign you... of uh, dreaming. And then the, the flashing lights are supposed to say, hey, hey, dreaming person, do you realize <laughs> you're having a dream and this is your really expensive face mask telling you <laughs> to turn this into a lucid dream? This is battery <laughs> take, operated? Take, yeah, it takes a bit of practice. Uh, <laughs> it's like and, an airline mask. And did it work? It, eventually it worked, but it really took a while. You know, the thing is, it's very curious about lucid dreams because in some ways, uh, in your normal dream state, you've got a really rather low IQ. And I can remember uh, dreaming of being at a dinner party with a lot of people at a table wearing a mask. And the woman next to me said, why are you wearing that stupid <laughs> mask? And you'd think, well, that would be the cue for saying, aha, because that is my very special new scientist lucid dreaming mask, and I hereby convert this into a lucid dream, and no, not a bit of it. But on the occasion that I did uh, manage to achieve a lucid dream, you know, as a physicist, my first thought is, well, what are the laws of physics in this dream world? And I had this really good idea that I never had in my waking life. I thought, if I look at my image in a mirror, will it be inverted like it is in the real world? And it was. So that was a wonderful idea for an experiment that occurred to me in the dream. Next time I'm going to do the Galileo experiment. <laughs> okay, so um, are we alone? Uh, right, well, are we alone? So the short answer to that is we don't know. And I'll tell you the reason why that question cannot be answered in our present state of ignorance. Uh, there's something called the Drake equation, which sets out all of the things that we need to know before we can answer the question, are we alone in the universe? And one term in that equation dominates all the others. It's the term that represents the probability that if you have an Earth-like planet, a suitable abode for life, uh, then life will pop up on that planet. That is, it's the probability of the transition from non-living to living matter. Now, if we knew how that happened, if we knew the mechanism, we could have a go at estimating the odds. Very big error bars, but nevertheless we could try it. But you can't estimate the odds of an unknown process, and at present, we don't know what that process was, so we can say nothing about whether it's very likely or exceedingly unlikely. And it's easy to cook up scenarios where it could be either. We could imagine that there is some sort of deep principle of organization in the universe driving matter towards greater complexity, and life is one such state of complexity, and that this will happen wherever you have favorable conditions. We can imagine such a principle. We haven't found it, but we could imagine it. 
We can equally imagine that the transition from non-life to life involved uh, a long series of rather improbable events, say chemical accidents, one after the other, each of which on its own might not be stupendously improbable, but put together as a sequence, it may have occurred only once in the observable universe. And so the only way we're ever going to find out, are we alone in the universe, is to go look. I think we're not going to figure it out on theoretical grounds. I, th I think you and I, I think we've talked about this before, and we had seemed to have a disagreement about what type of transition non-life to life would be. And I think right. you, you thought of it more as an starting a fire or a phase transition. I thought of it as a very, very gradual handicap ramp. Right. So um, it could be either, and I agree with you entirely. We don't know. Uh, it's unlikely that there would be a single transition that would suddenly mark the event, it's alive. Uh, I think there would be a number of such transitions, or it could be a sort of seamless continuity uh, between the non-living and living realms. I like to think, and my present research suggests, that, uh, that one of these, probably many, transitions that took place was not a transition in matter or the organization of matter or the flow of energy or anything like that that people have been thinking about. It was a transition in the architecture of information, the information being processed. Because when we characterize a living thing, we always use informational language. Uh, if you talk to a biologist, you know, what is life? You'll be given a narrative in terms of things like uh, codes and transcription and translation and signals and all that sort of information speak. Talk to a chemist or a physicist, what is life, and you'll be given description in terms of entropy and energy and chemical affinities and thermodynamics. Uh, so we've got these two parallel narratives of life and somehow we have to join them together. And I think that the key to understanding how life began is really in the way that from some sort of complex network of chemical reactions, the way that the information was flowing around and stored in the system transformed to a distinctive type of pattern or motif. And what we're doing at Arizona State University is we're studying the informational patterns in known living systems, looking at things like gene regulatory networks. We've been looking at the cell cycle of yeast, but we're also looking at these, the uh, regulatory network that controls the uh, development of the sea urchin and one or two others and what we are finding is that the pattern of information flowing around these systems uh, is very different from random. So we're thinking that there's a parallel story. We have the uh, origin of life. We can think of that as a sort of chemical climbing Mount Improbable, as Richard Dawkins will put it, that you have to get the right stuff and bit by bit through some sort of process of accident or e evolution or natural selection or some combination of things, uh, we go up and up uh, and up this mountain of complexity. But alongside that mountain of material complexity, there is also a mountain of informational complexity. And that's the one we're studying. It's been completely ne neglected so far. All right, and so you, uh, let's see. So are you alone in the universe? <laughs> well, sometimes when I become solipsistic, uh, I feel, well, I uh, am alone in the universe, uh, because, of course, in that deep philosophical sense, there's no way I can tell whether you, who, on the face of it, seem like a sentient being, by analogy with me, uh, I cannot know that you really are sentient, that there really is a, a conscious Charlie Lineweaver inside there, and that you're not some cleverly programmed automaton that is just sort of mouthing things that sound fairly convincing. And you can extend that to the whole universe. If we live in a simulated universe, then I assume that all of the people around me are actually simulated beings. Uh, now, you mentioned this idea the other day that you thought that it's very likely that we could be in a simulation. Could you uh, justify that a bit? Yeah, it's very easy to come up with that uh, conclusion if you just look at the raw statistics. So uh, the way I see it is this, that um, you know, we physicists are always hampered by uh, money. We're, the budget's never big enough to do the sort of thing we want. Uh, and so uh, think of the biggest physics experiment that you can imagine, and that is make another universe. That would really need a really, really big budget. But if instead I said, well, simulate another universe, and you need only simulate enough of that universe that one conscious being in this universe is aware of their immediate surroundings. So maybe that's me here now, and I see this room and a few things outside. 
the mm. rest of it we don't need to bother with uh, until I walk out out of the hotel. Uh, and so uh, the, the point is that simulated worlds are much cheaper than real worlds. And so if there is a way of creating real and simulated worlds, the simulated ones are going to proliferate uh, because they're, they're so much easier to make. And so if anybody is into making worlds, they're going to be making lots and lots and lots of simulations and very few of the real thing. So any arbitrary observer is overwhelmingly more likely to be found in a simulation than in a real universe. So that's the statistical argument. But the, in, part of this argument is the cost. And you said to talk about it's much easier to make a simulation than, uh, than uh, I guess, a real one. But simulations come at different prices. You can make uh, one with the H bar, for example, is gigantic and a pixelization of one billion light years. Or you can make one a pixelization of the Planck time. Right. right so, yeah, yeah. so why this particular, I mean, if there must be some probability distribution of the cost of the simulated universes that have been produced. And I would have thought that they would have built in obsolescence like many products today. Uh, you're probably right. I'm sure it's going to be more expensive to make a really, really good, fine-grained, detailed universe. But how do I know I'm living in such a thing? Because uh, I can write down equations uh, with H bar, and I know the laws of physics, and I know some clever people go and test all these things at the microscopic level. But I've never done that. It's good enough for me to get by just to have this sort of rough and ready uh, experience that we're having now and a few other things tacked on. So, so really I, I accept only as an act of faith that if I were to dig deep enough I would uncover all of those regularities that you're talking about. So you really think that it's possible that we could be in a simulation right now? Absolutely possible, it, certainly possible. And on the, face of it, on the face of it, it looks probable. Okay, and who made the simulation? Who simu who's the simulator? Ah, interesting. What is the simulating system? Because I'm sure it's not a, you know, a being or a person or uh, anything remotely like us. It's, it's, a, it's a system. Well, the problem is that we can't say anything about it uh, any more than a uh, uh, you know, computer image in my computer can say anything about uh, the plug in the wall that's keeping the computer running. So, so it's very, very hard for us to know what is the nature of the simulating system, except... Uh, except that it had know, to come what, first? It's, it, the, the point is, whatever it is that's doing it has made a decision to do it, you know, and you have to ask, well, why? Why would you do that? Is this just a bit of fun? Is this uh, curiosity, uh, empathy? Uh, it's, I, I, so we're in the same situation as people used to be years ago, trying to figure out, you know, what is God? Why? God made the universe, God made us, you know, why, what's, what's in God's mind, what's the point, how do we fit in, oh, we can't solve a mystery. Well, we're in very much the same situation, if you believe it's a simulation. But the simulator had to pre exist before the simulation, right? Uh, well, t it's interesting when you use the word before. In the logically prior sense, yes. Not necessarily in the time sense, because uh, our simulation has its own time. Yes. which may not be anything to do with the time of the simulating world. Uh -huh. uh, just like when we run a computer, we run something really, really fast in a computer. And if we achieve computer consciousness, as some people believe we are on the threshold of doing this, you know, we could probably give this uh, conscious entity in some super duper computer uh, a million experiences uh, every second, whereas we can only cope with, uh, what is it, 10? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, um, Let's see, this big picture, the idea of having a big picture and where humanity fits into the universe, is that important? Well, it's important to me. It's part of the reason I went into science. I wanted to know as a teenager how the world was put together and what I was doing in it and whether I had some sort of free will and uh, did time go on forever and space go on forever? Why was I living now? Why was I me? You know, all of these questions that I think all young people ask. Uh, I never grew up. I never, most people grow out of it. I never did. And so I, for me, it's really important to ask those big questions. And our center at ASU, the Center for Fundamental Concepts in Science, in science has its, its motto, confronting the big questions. So that's what we like to do. Uh, but it doesn't I, seem to have as good, as much a popular appeal as a good religion might. Well, it substitutes for religion. So I see the post-religious world that we're living in, in societies like in Australia, uh, where most people are not religious in any conventional sense, yet they still 
hunger after some deeper meaning to their lives. And I see those people as my natural cons constituency because what I can say to those people is science uncovers a you know, wonderland of um, Im important facts about the universe and it does not in any way diminish your own significance by finding that the universe is truly vast and, uh, and in some ways frightening. Nevertheless, it does seem that the emergence of life and, and mind somehow fit into this great cosmic scheme and that if we can find a way of making this palatable to people, perhaps that will take care of their, what we might think of as spiritual hunger, that conventional religion uh, is, is no longer doing. So you have a distraught young student who comes to your office and says, my life is meaningless, I have no idea what's going on, and you tell them, your purpose of your life is to produce entropy, and they go away happy. <laughs> Buck your ideas <laughs> up. <laughs> um, well, now you see, I would say, uh, I wouldn't put it like that. I would say that you're uh, part of, you have emerged as uh, a natural process in a universe which is uh, extraordinarily, um, not only just all these terms that people use, like, you know, beautiful and awe-inspiring and so on, but ingeniously contrived to bring about the emergence of, of life and mind and, and beings who can reflect on the significance of it all. And that doesn't mean you're at the center of the universe or the pinnacle of creation or anything like that, but it does mean that you have a place and uh, that you should celebrate that place. I'm not sure that gives you any comfort. It, the point is it doesn't do what religion does for many people. It doesn't give us comfort uh, in the face of death. That, that I can't provide. Through Why, sure you can. You just say, hey, just identify with your germ cells. Well, uh, I suppose you could say that. I've never tried uh, saying that to a, you know, a grieving widow, but uh, <laughs> I suspect it wouldn't go down too well. I thought it goes down really well. That's why people who die love to be surrounded by their grandchildren, I think. Well, I think Woody Allen once said that, uh, that uh, he wants to be uh, immortal uh, and that immortality can be achieved through your children and grandchildren. That's what some people do, and some people achieve immortality through their works. He wants to achieve immortality by not dying. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how about the, uh, in the initial entropy problem? Now, entropy is increasing. That means in the past it had to be very, very low. And now, is that a problem? I, sometimes people say, oh, why? Uh, Penrose, for example, would say, well, the, it should start out at maximum entropy and therefore nothing should happen. But our universe started out at low entropy and that's an incredible problem. Is that a problem for you? Uh, it was a problem for me until I solved it in the mid-1970s. Oh, how did you solve it? How did you solve it? <laughs> I thought about it and I realized that gravitation completely changed the rules of the game. So on the face of it, we live in a universe, the entropy is going up, it's uh, going to maybe head to some sort of maximum in the far future. And in the past, it should have been lower. And if you equate uh, entropy and probability, that is, if a low entropy state is far less probable than a high entropy state, you're left with the problem that the universe began in a highly improbable state. And unless you want to invoke some sort of external agency for setting it up that way, uh, then it's difficult. But once you realize uh, that gravitation changes the rules of the game, uh, then it doesn't solve the problem, but it changes its complexity, and, and here's how. Uh, that we know as the universe expands, uh, the, the matter and uh, radiation that are in the universe <coughs> excuse me, can be pulled out of equilibrium as a result of that expanding universe. And so uh, there's an entropy gap that uh, opens up, and we're living off that entropy gap. And there are other mechanisms as well to introduce an ent entropy gap. For example, the uh, uh, material uh, that is coughed out of the Big Bang was relatively smoothly distributed, and as it clumped together to form galaxies and stars, uh, that led to temperature gradients, and we're living off one such from, from the sun. But if we, uh, but if we started but, at, at equilibrium, you said we got pulled, the entropy gap, they got pulled out of equilibrium. Now, I was taught in cosmology that photons, do, uh, the expansion of the universe does not pull photons out of equilibrium. The number doesn't change and therefore it stays right. the same. Yeah, yeah. so just a, a gas of just uh, photons uh, in an expanding universe, the entropy won't change. But what you've got is uh, not just photons, you've got photons, you've got uh, non-relativistic matter, uh, and in particular you have inhomogeneities because this is really where you see uh, the rise of uh, the temperature gradients uh, when you, you have stars forming and uh, the uh, regions around the stars 
uh, these temperature gradients drive all of the irreversible processes that we see, almost all that we see on Earth. So we're faced with a situation where the universe began with the matter and uh, radiation in thermodynamic equilibrium uh, for the constraints at the time, but the gravitation was out of thermodynamic equilibrium. What do you mean by that? Uh, the, uh, the, as time goes on, matter tends to clump more and more, and the ultimate end state of that is the black hole, and we have a precise formula for the entropy of a black hole. So the Stephen Hawking works it out. So a homogeneous distribution of matter is the uh, high entropy, low entropy. Low state. entropy from the point of view of gravitation. Okay. Okay. It's a low entropy. So state. how did it get even homogeneously distributed? So then the so then that's of course the, the the key point. We can understand that the matter and radiation component of the universe uh, is there's no paradox there. Its entropy is going up all the time. Uh, it's, uh, but that doesn't mean it was out of thermodynamic equilibrium in the past. It was still in thermodynamic equi equilibrium in the past at, at the beginning. Uh, but because of the gravitational disturbance, it's been pulled out of thermodynamic equilibrium. So the, the, although the entropy has gone up, the maximum possible entropy has also gone up. Uh, and so then we go back to the question of how has the gravitational degrees of freedom, how have those degree of, degrees of freedom been set at the beginning in this relatively low entropy state so that the matter and radiation, everything is smoothly distributed. And there are many possible answers to that. I don't think we know which is the correct one. Um, but one possibility is that if you have something like a multiverse, uh, you have all possible beginnings and, uh, and we can imagine that if you take a sort of God's eye view and look at the entire multiverse, the infinite assemblage of universes, uh, that uh, you know, some will have the arrow of time going this way and some will have the arrow of time going that way and overall the whole thing is, uh, is time symmetric. Uh, that's one possible escape from this. But I think we don't, actually don't know the answer. But, it, but the, the key point is that we get away from this elementary idea uh, that the, uh, the, the universe of matter uh, and radiation that we see around us is uh, driving the entropy up all the time uh, and therefore the entropy was lower in the past and that's a paradox. The entropy was lower in the past but it's not a paradox because the gravitational circumstances in the past were different from what they are today. That's the key point. Okay, so tell us the most important things we know about the universe and the most important things we don't know about the universe. <laughs> well, uh, when I was a student there was very little we did know about the universe other than the fact that it was expanding and there was a sort of assumption it began with a big bang and that was about it. Uh, uh, today uh, cosmology has become a quantitative science and so we know a lot of things really rather precisely. Uh, so we know quite a bit about uh, the initial state of the universe. It wasn't totally and completely smooth as we were discussing a few moments ago. It had some sort of ripples or corrugations or irregularities imprinted on it and that shows up in the cosmic microwave background radiation. The afterglow of the Big Bang has got these tiny variations which over time grew to become clusters of galaxies. Uh, and so we can ask the question, where did those tiny variations come from? Uh, if you want me to, to lapse into religious language, why did God create the Big Bang with tiny ripples in it that would be needed for the emergence of galaxies at some later stage? Uh, can we attribute those ripples to a physical mechanism? And I think uh, the answer is uh, almost certainly yes. We can attribute it to quantum processes that took place in the very early universe, probably associated with the so-called inflationary epoch, where the universe leapt in size by some enormous factor in a tiny split second. Uh, those quantum processes are something I happened to work on myself back in the 1970s. Uh, and so uh, I like the idea that the reason that there are clusters of galaxies is because of these quantum variations that were uh, imprinted on the very early universe because of processes that took place in the first split second. We don't absolutely know that. There may be other reasons for it, but that's, uh, that's one of the things we like to know about. The other big mystery, of course, that everybody asks is what happened before the Big Bang. Uh, and that divides into two possibilities. One is that nothing happened before the Big Bang because it was the origin of time. Uh, that was the picture when I was a student. Nothing more to be said. Time began with the Big Bang. Uh, and the other is that there was something before the Big Bang and we'd like to know what. And so in the multiverse picture I was just talking about, 
there is a sort of everlasting superstructure within which universes like ours pop up like bubbles uh, scattered throughout space and time for all eternity. Uh, and so it's a very popular view. Uh, but we absolutely don't know in our present state of observational knowledge whether the Big Bang was the ultimate origin of all physical things or just the beginning of a sort of localized bubble uh, that we call the universe, but is really only a tiny fragment of a much bigger system. So give me the short version, the things we, the most important things we know and important things we don't know. Right. We know the universe is expanding. We know it began with the Big Bang. Uh, we know it's got ripples imprinted on it that give rise to clusters of galaxies. Uh, we don't know how it's going to end. We can sort of extrapolate and guess how it might end. Uh, we don't know what happened before the Big Bang. Uh, and we don't quite know why it's got the properties it does, in particular three dimensions of space and one of time. Okay, and uh, you look like you're made out of matter. Uh, how come? So matter uh, is not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so baryogenesis, when did that uh, yes. happen and why so, did it happen and did it necessarily happen? Uh, yeah. It's interesting that Darwin said uh, there's no point in speculating about the origin of life, one might as well speculate about the origin of matter. Uh, but I think we can explain where matter comes from. Uh, where we can make matter in the lab. I think a lot of people are surprised to hear that. We can, we can just go and do it. Um, and, uh, but we make equal quantities of matter and antimatter. Well, that's the point. Uh, and so it always comes with its mirror image, the antimatter, uh, in equal uh, and opposite quantities. And if you put the two together, they disappear again. So it's a reversible process. So th something has broken that symmetry between the matter and the antimatter. When the Big Bang coughed out stuff, it was uh, a lot of matter, a lot of antimatter, but just a tiny excess of the matter. Uh, when did and, that happen? Well, the current thinking is that this happened uh, probably uh, at about just after the end of inflation, about 10 to the minus 30-something seconds uh, after the Big Bang, when the strong nuclear force and the weak and electromagnetic forces uh, were merged in identity and had comparable mm -hmm. strength. Uh, and that seems to provide a theoretical framework, at least, uh, for breaking the symmetry between matter and antimatter, or if you like, uh, enabling a particle of matter to turn into a particle of antimatter, or vice versa. Uh, that, that that was the epoch at which really the excess of matter got locked in. Why is that epoch favored over, for example, the Planck scale when gravity is separated from the other three forces? Uh, you could certainly do it at the Planck scale. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Uh, but if you want to play the inflationary game, which a lot of people do, then that comes after the Planck scale. That comes uh, several orders of magnitude in time later than the Planck time. And so if you get your uh, you know, tidy excess of matter over antimatter prior to that and then inflate it uh, all away, you, you still have an empty universe. So you really want to play the matter game after the end of inflation. Inflation, in effect, because the universe balloons in size by such an enormous factor, in effect, empties it out. You end up with nothing. It's just empty space. And so you've got to make the matter after that. But some people put inflation at the Planck scale. I've you can do Planck scale inflation. There are many, many models. And part of the problem is all of this stuff is very speculative because we can write down theoretical models that can pretty much do anything you want. And it's hard to get much of a handle on it because everything that we see uh, really that uh, has clues to that epoch comes uh, from much later. It comes from the cosmic uh, background heat radiation, which is in effect coming from about 380,000 years after the Big Bang, so much, much later. It just carries an imprint, a fossil, if you like, of what occurred at that much earlier epoch. So if I gave you a billion dollars, no, let's make it 10 billion, like 100 billion dollars, with the condition that you were to use this money to help answer the question, are we alone, what would you do with it? Well, uh, what I wouldn't do uh, is uh, just more of the same research. So uh, SETI, I'm a great supporter of SETI, a well wish always have been, but I think that traditional radio SETI of sweeping the skies with radio telescopes, hoping that ET is beaming a message directly at us, uh, is a futile exercise uh, for a very simple reason, uh, that ET doesn't know we are here. ET, say, might be a thousand light years away, will see Earth as it was a thousand years ago, uh, there were no radio telescopes, and so it makes no sense for a civilization a thousand light years away to be directing radio messages towards us. They may be 
beaming radio messages out into the universe for all sorts of reasons that we could pick up, but they won't be directly beaming at us. And so I think uh, the, the best strategy is to look instead for beacons, which would be could be radio sources, could be laser sources that would sweep the plane of the galaxy a little bit like a lighthouse sweeps, sweeps the horizon. It's not a message intended for any particular captain of a ship, but it's out there for anyone who might uh, tune in to see. And I think uh, what we need to do is use our radio telescopes to stare towards the center of the galaxy for an extended period of time in the hope of seeing repeated transient messages, not messages, but pulses, radio or opt optical pulses, and not look for narrow band radio signals coming from particular stars, uh, given, giving them half an hour each. And what would be the motivation strategy. for these beacons? Uh, all sorts of motivations for uh, making beacons. One of these uh, might just be altruism. It could be that uh, an advanced civilization wants to dispense their wisdom to the galaxy as a whole. It could be vanity. It could be somebody's monument, like the pyramids. Uh, it could be uh, a warning, uh, could, could be any number of reasons that people might do it. But I, I agree, uh, it's an expensive undertaking. Uh, you'd need a lot of resources. But in the history of human anthropology and tribes, I don't know all the things you mentioned, uh, I guess the pyramids, for example, they were set up for internal conception, not necessarily for, hey, if there are any foreigners out here, look, I'm here. Is that the case? Yes. Um, well, I think uh, uh, s some of these were just personal aggrandizement. Uh, so some of them were intended to convey wisdom or messages. Uh, so yeah. obelisks that have, uh, you know, writing. Uh, I don't think it's all, uh, you know, extolling the wonders of its uh, builder or the local uh, uh, king, whoever right. it was. Um, and, and people build monuments just for aesthetic reasons. Uh, we do this today. We. Right. Uh, you know, we might, might build a tower or something just because it looks beautiful. This, this, we're, talk, we're talking in general about the big picture, and you mentioned as a youth you were asking questions of where do I fit in, and how does the, knowing more about the big picture help you be a better person or change your life? Well, I'm not sure it helps me be a better person in the ethical sense. I don't think, uh, you know, I help more old ladies across the road uh, <laughs> because I'm concerned about the big picture. Um, but uh, for, for me, I, well, first of all, I think we're, we're very privileged. I belong to a very, very small group of people who society is prepared to pay uh, to sit around and think. I, when I was planning my career in my mid-teens and discussed it with my father, who was completely baffled, uh, and, and an enduring comment is he said, well, nobody will pay you to sit and think. <laughs> <laughs> Well, by and large, that's true. Uh, jo jobs where you are paid to sit and think are pretty rare, but, uh, but my job is, is one of them. Uh, does that make me a better person? I, I write books. I like to talk to people, uh, uh, not just at dinner parties, but on, on television and to give lectures uh, and convey what I see as the good news of science. I think science is generally uh, not, not just exciting and, and fascinating, uh, it, it is actually good news. It tells us that we live in a universe that is truly wonderful in which human beings can have a place. Uh, it's a message I like to tell. When, uh, when I was a teenager, I would go to parties, and I noticed that the people who were good dancers were not very self-conscious. And what <laughs> yes. you're talking about here is a rising, the sense, raising, increasing a sense of self-consciousness, and that isn't necessarily a positive good. For, for example, it keeps you from being a good dancer. <laughs> right. so, so what you're trying to say is that the more we know about the universe, it's better for us, but then I think of these teenage parties where it was worse for you if you thought about yourself. So uh, there must be a downside to this heightened awareness. Uh, well, there is, there, of course, um, the danger that you can fall into, uh, which is also a danger that lurks in religious cults, is that people become very introspective. They withdraw from the world and they just go to some sort of inner space of, uh, of, of deep uh, meaning uh, and that generally is is a downside and so when I think of you know monks and nuns who've effectively well not all of them but most of them have withdrawn from the world devoted their lives to uh, you know contemplation I'm not sure that's uh, such a wonderful thing I think um, a, f a handful of scientists who I know have actually become like that they, they've really become recluses uh, and, uh, the, and they're preoccupied with these great questions of existence. Um, who, who uh, like Julian uh, Barber? I don't want to name names, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, <laughs> but we know who they are. Uh, and, 
I'm, I'm not like that, and I think, you know, partly because uh, uh, in an academic job alongside that sort of intense uh, in, introspection, uh, you, you have very practical things. You have to teach classes and sit on committees and write reports, and uh, also I have a family and uh, I'm brought down to earth. And so people often will say to me, well, how can you switch uh, between this, uh, you know, think about rarefied things like the interior structure of black holes one minute to cutting the grass the next? Uh, and my wife actually expressed it very well uh, when I gave uh, a lecture that she was sitting in. I think it was about time travel or something, can't remember, which she really enjoyed. And she said I was fantastic and it was really eloquent. And she thought to herself all the time, was this the same man who bumbles around the house looking for his keys? <laughs> <laughs> right. how, about, how about death, for example? It's often said that humans are the only animals that know that they're going to die. Do you think that's useful? Uh, useful to know that we're going to die. Yeah. Well, or for example, uh, let's suppose yeah. that we find out that we're meaningless. Is that useful to right, find out right, that we are right, as meaningless as some right. of us think we are? Right. There's a great danger uh, if you convince yourself that everything is totally pointless because it would undermine your motivation to live. And I think some people en end up committing suicide because they arrive at the conclusion that their lives are worthless. And I think that's a, that is a tragedy. So I suppose I would say that even if our lives are worthless, it's better to maintain the illusion that they're worth something. And I do think they are worth something. I mean, personally, I think they're worth something. Uh, based on but, some scientific uh, theory? Or? Based on, yes, my understanding of, uh, of the nature of life and mind in the universe. But they're not uh, imbued with that extraordinary significance of the bygone era when people thought God had made them as an act of special creation and that they were put on the world for some you know, particularly divine purpose. I don't believe that. I see. So I, I asked you about well, if I gave you a billion dollars or a hundred billion dollars to find aliens. Yeah, I'm not sure I spent it all yet. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, so what, so what, would, what was your answer so far? <laughs> well, it was uh, to uh, do, not do, the, do, do the status not quo. Not do traditional SETI, but look for beacons. Uh, okay. But I would also uh, try to uh, hammer away at that term I was talking about earlier in the Drake equation, the, the big unknown. We know there's plenty of real estate on which life might emerge, but we mm -hmm. don't know the probability that non-life turns into life. However that is, whether it's a sudden or a gradual process, we don't know uh, what that mechanism was. So origin of life uh, research. So the origin of life. But uh, one of the, my pet projects is you go look uh, to see if there, uh, there was more than one origin of life on Earth. Uh, is there more than one form of life on Earth? Right. What we need is a second genesis, a second sample of life, wherever we find it, elsewhere in the universe or here on Earth. I see. Now, one, I, I asked this, an Indian student who was very concerned about the environment, New Delhi air was pretty polluted, what he would do with the money, and he would say, well, I'd spend it on the environment, because the whole point was to keep alive. If you want to observe the aliens, you have to, you have to survive. It's like the number one requirement of seeing something in the future is to stay alive. And so his basis, basically he wanted to spend the money trying to stay alive. I'm not sure exactly how you do that, reduce pollution or reduce population or something. But that, that was his point. You don't need scientific instruments. All you need to do is survive. And that's not obvious that we will. Right. Uh, well, what he's right is not obvious that we will survive. But it would be a waste of money to just spend $100 billion on cleaning up the planet. Because what you've got to do is clean up people's minds, people's attitudes. Uh, that uh, the uh, world's population uh, basically has made uh, maintaining our environment and the habitability of the earth a rather low uh, priority enterprise. And so uh, the hundred billion dollars should be used to try to educate and lobby people into thinking more uh, positively about the planet on which they live so that we look after it better. Because the hundred million dollars would soon be negated by uh, the next Hundred billion, wave, uh, hundred billion uh, would would. I mean, obviously, it could uh, could pay for a, a clean up. But what we need is an education. Uh, could be much better spending on educating people and convincing them that we all have to try and do something. Okay. How now? If there are aliens, ETs out there. Well, first of all, you used the word they. Mm. You didn't say it. You used the plural rather than a right. singular. Right. Yes, so what's yes, the justification right. for that? Well, I think you see, you are probably right because I foresee uh, a post-biological phase of intelligence almost happening here on Earth. And uh, if we fast forward a million years, it's clear that the intellectual heavy lifting would be done not by flesh and blood beings, but by uh, designed entities, which may be uh, partly biological. We can always design or redesign biological things. Uh, but I think the distinction between the living and the non-living worlds will, 
will, will disappear. The distinction between the natural the artificial would disappear. And so we can uh, imagine in the very far future uh, designed and then redesigned and re-redesigned uh, systems uh, that are not just um, uh, for doing physical tasks but doing intellectual tasks as well. And because you can network these systems, just like we network computers uh, today, uh, it's not clear that individual identity is going to retain much of a meaning. So we'll have some vast intellectual system that processes information, takes in data, comes up with great thoughts, delivers wisdom, uh, and it will be a, a thing. It probably isn't going to be them. So maybe we should be using the pronoun it rather than they. Yes, I think, uh, I think probably. But the vast majority of people I talk to about aliens, they're always talking about they. they yeah, too they, much they, Hollywood, they. I think. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, could you, uh, let's see, will we recognize the aliens if they are there? Will we recognize it or they or them? Uh, yeah, I've thought about this. Uh, how will we know it if we saw it? Uh, because uh, it's uh, all of the things that we think of in terms of intelligent agents or their products are based on our own experience. And so it's very tempting to just sort of extrapolate that Right, so if there were an alien probe in the system, it would be a great chunk of metal with flashing lights or something, you know, bits sticking out of it. Um, uh, or, or if it was a computer, you know, it would be something sort of humming uh, and, uh, uh, you know, screens with printout and so on. Well, of course, it's all very naive. Um, we, we really don't know what a system uh, that has been designed uh, for a million generations might actually look like, how it might function, and it may not be apparent to us at all uh, that what was going on inside uh, was uh, any, any sort of intellectual activity. Because I, I, and I say intellectual activity because the physical activity side of the future of in intelligence in the universe is likely to be more limited. We recognize life for, uh, at the moment from the physical behavior, um, you know, and scurry around making nests and so on. I don't think we could expect that from some very far future type of design system. Uh, and so it might mean that it's very inconspicuous. In fact, uh, if it's the case uh, that to optimize its intellectual power, it has to go to the quantum realm, what Frank Wilczek, call, Wilczek calls quintelligence, uh, then it's going to be some sort of um, refrigerated uh, system that may not have very much inside in terms of numbers of degrees of freedom because quantum entanglement means you can get stupendous uh, amounts of information processing from a very small amount of stuff. Uh, but it might well be in the intergalactic spaces where it's very cold. It's a good place to, to put something. So well, how about, it may not have much of, a, of, a, of an imprint Well, how about the, the quantum fluctuations that we think are responsible for the uh, acceleration of the universe? Could that be, uh, I don't know, alien talk? Yes, so can, can the universe itself be conscious through its own quantum I'm complexity? I'm not sure conscious, but alive. Well, all, right, you know, all right, 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 yeah. So um, if you extend your definition enough, then what you have got down at the Planck level uh, you know, is, a, is a sort of froth of complexity, uh, which... Um, but may, maybe it's just random, or maybe there is some signal there. Uh, right, how would we know? Yes. I mean, how, we can't d dig into that space-time foam. Uh, at the Planck scale to know whether there is something uh, how about, how about a bit looking, more organized going. How about looking at variations in the Lamb shift? Well, um, if that's the vacuum mean, fluctuations, fluctuations on, affecting the energy levels and then uh, they're varying in a might, random way or non-random. It might spell out an SOS yeah, message. For example. <laughs> or be talking to it. So I have no idea. But, but I'm just trying to get at ways to do this. To uh, well, it's an intriguing thought. Um, uh, because, you see, mostly when we, uh, we have some good theoretical reason to suppose something's random, uh, we very rarely uh, go and check on it. Yeah, uh, yeah. All, all we get is, you know, some complicated uh, output, and we sort of think, well, it should be random, and, it's, and it seems right. random. But the point about, um, as we know now from algorithmic information theory, is that if I want to deliver a message to you in the most economical way, uh, unless you have the key... So the message, if it's in code, unless you have the key, it looks random. It's no different from random. Uh, so if we had the key to the universe, we might see that it's screaming at us. <laughs> <laughs> or has been for a while. Now, I've heard that, so what, tell us about the post-detection committee that you were on or ahead, and uh, 
Tell me, have you drawn up the uh, terms of the Treaty of Unconditional Surrender yet? Uh, right. So uh, this curious body, the uh, SETI Post-Detection Task Group, was set up many years ago by the International Academy of Astronautics. And it was a sort of motley collection of scientists and journalists and uh, some media people and a couple of lawyers and a priest. Um, and it had no budget, and so its deliberations were really rather limited. But its purpose was to reflect on what do we do, uh, not necessarily should ET make contact. I think that's the scenario everybody has in mind. Oh my God, we got the message, what do we do now? Who do we tell? Mm -hmm. uh, and so on. But really more, um, uh, supposing we uh, got incontrovertible evidence that we are not alone in the universe, you know, what next? Uh, and there are issues such as, well, if there is a particular location in the sky where we think there are other, uh, there's another civilization, let's put it that way, you know, should we just grab every available radio telescope and start beaming home, uh, homespun wisdom to, to these uh, entities? Uh, or should there be a bit more deliberation and control? Uh, you know, and who calls the shots? So those were the sorts of things we thought about. I have to say that in recent years, uh, this task group uh, looks like it has sort of evaporated away. Uh, but the IAA has uh, convened a sort of parallel uh, group and the, um, the SETI community in any case developed a protocol for how to deal with uh, in, in the event of a putative message many years ago. And, and it sets out some very obvious steps like who you tell first and, and so forth. But you I think your we, friends. <laughs> well, well, you know, I think we all agree that uh, it wouldn't work out uh, on the day as advertised because in these days of social media, it, it only takes, uh, you know, one, uh, one cleaner in the radio observatory to suspect there's something up, uh, you know, to text her boyfriend and uh, okay. then, it, then it's in the New York Times. <laughs> now, Harriet Tubman, during the Civil War in America, uh, saved a lot of slaves, brought them north in the Underground Railroad. And uh, she was asked about this, and she said, I saved a thousand slaves. I could have saved a thousand more if they knew they were slaves. Yeah. So the idea is that the identity of somebody can, would help, kind of like humanity coming out of the closet in some sense, if we figure out how we compare to the, how we fit into the universe. Is that how you view your search for how we fit in? Uh, and I, if so, when will you come out of the closet? Are you saying that, uh, that we're all in some, somehow slaves to some Well, for example, we, men, most of us think we have free will. Oh, right. And let's say right, that right, some right. scientist says that you have no free will, right. and then everybody right. realizes they have no free will, and then, but it's, they're embarrassed to admit it because right. they feel like you have free will. So things like, I mean, there are many, many things like that, but that's one good example. Right. Well, I mentioned earlier that there are some uh, uh, myths, if indeed uh, they are myths, that are better retained uh, because just for leading a good life. Uh, 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 that it, it's important that we believe certain things. So we have to assume our lives have some significance, otherwise we would just not bother to do anything that we're doing. Uh, we've got to find a way of uh, motivating people to, to carry on and maybe achieve better things. Uh, that's one thing. Another curious thing uh, that I thought a lot, a lot about is our impression that time is flowing or moving. And everything I understand about physics tells me that time doesn't flow or move or pass. Uh, that these um, uh, popular ideas are simply illusions or confusions. Uh, but daily life would be impossible if we uh, didn't uh, proceed on the basis that in some sense time does pass. So I don't think it does, but we behave as if it does. Uh, and so um, I, I think there are a number of, a number of things that uh, fall into that category of uh, uh, things which uh, may not be true, but we had better continue to believe in them if we want to function. Uh, so we shouldn't lives. scientifically investigate whether they are or are not true then? Uh, well, we can. Uh, <laughs> we can investigate it, but we should maintain should believe the our illusion. Results. <laughs> so, the, <laughs> so, you know, I've come to the conclusion time doesn't pass, but, but I'm going to carry on behaving as if it does. Unless you take your results seriously. Well, sometimes I lie awake at night and I think, well, okay, if it isn't passing. I mean, in the, clearly it doesn't pass. Look, there, there are future states, there are past states, of course. Uh, and there are future states of my mind and past states of my mind. Uh, and the mistake that people have is assuming that they have an invariant personal identity, uh, that, uh, that the you at five is the you at 50, uh, and, and it's not. 
uh, that, that you, you change moment by moment, the world changes moment by moment, past yous and past moments are different from future yous and future moments, nothing's flowing or moving. There's simply future yous and past yous. Uh, and sometimes that gives me comfort because I think, well, in another million years there'll still be the, the past Paul Davis events at various stages and it, it's not going to go away in that four-dimensional sense. So your existence gives you comfort? I suppose you might say that. <laughs> <laughs> so, last question. So, are we alone? Uh, let me give three answers to that. So, uh, as a scientist, Paul Davies, the scientist, sits here and tells you uh, that uh, all of the evidence that I see convinces me that the transition from non-life to life is exceedingly difficult, and therefore the default assumption for me is that, yes, we are alone. That's the default assumption. And Paul Davis, the human being, thinks, well, that would be a terrible thing uh, to, to imagine that, uh, that we're alone. That depresses me. I'd love to think that the universe is full of, of interesting life and interesting beings. And so that as a human being, I'd love to think that. And then Paul Davis, the philosopher, says, well, you know, hold on. Uh, we've got to come up with some sort of argument. But uh, one argument is... Uh, that uh, what's this vast universe for, with all its uh, tr trillions of uh, the, the planets and b billions and billions of galaxies and so on? What you know, what is it all for? If there's just sort of one group of people here to appreciate it, and so that it seems like a waste of a huge waste of stuff uh, to not populate it. Uh, that's a philosophical or maybe even a religious argument. So there are these three different moods that I find myself in. Uh, but as a scientist, I have to simply come back to say, I think the default assumption is that we're alone unless we see evidence to the contrary. How about Paul Davies, the little boy who ah. was asking, who am I? How do I fit in? What, what kind of emotional, uh, what's the emotional reaction to this well, question? Well, when I was a little boy, I was terrified of the idea that there may be alien beings who, you know, might come here and take us over. Uh, so this was an enduring horror. Uh, so it's sort of ironical that I have uh, chosen a career that includes as part of my research the search for these alien beings that scared me so much as a child. But, uh, but there's one thing I've got over in recent years. Well, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not afraid of aliens. I'm not afraid of them anymore. Well, what, what kind of aliens would you like to meet? Some people say, oh, wisdom. And, and I, when I've asked people, you know, what kind of aliens would you like to meet, would like to meet these people who can answer all your questions and say, yes, yes. And the other people say, no, no, that would put me out of a job. <laughs> and then there are the young men who say, yeah, I want to have sexy aliens and have sex with them. And so from an emotional point of view, how do you deal with that? Um, well, I, uh, I come back to the, what I was saying earlier, that I think these are, are going to be post-biological uh, entities that we'd be dealing with. So no with. sex. Uh, so I'm, I don't think so. And, uh, and wisdom? You want uh, looking for them for wisdom? Well, wisdom will be good, yes. And I think, well, when, again, when you come back to the ancient world religions that people have depended upon so much throughout history, and we're now treating what we're talking about as a sort of surrogate for religion, um, that it's not just been about um, leading a good life or telling me what's going to happen when I die. It's also been about wisdom, uh, the idea that the old one or the, you know, the great one or the, the, the deity is, uh, is omniscient and know, knows it all and is, is a wise, a good, you know, a, the, the God is a wise God. In the monotheistic religions, I, I, in, in the polytheistic religions there are really stupid gods and jealous gods and capricious gods and childish gods, but, but I think the whole uh, thrust of monotheism is that God is supposed to be wise.